All right, uh, hello and welcome back to online English class, honors and regular English 1 students. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be spending our time working on OTN 1, which is going to analyze uh, the first scene of Heart of Darkness, uh, looking specifically at pages 45 through 50. Okay, uh, so before we get into that, uh, I want to go ahead and remind you of some of your tasks that you need to make sure that you're taking care of. Okay, so by the end of today uh, at 3 p.m., okay, uh, I need an email confirming that you have completed OTNs 8 and 9 uh, back from Unit 5. Those dealt with the Knight's Tale uh, Part 4 and also the entirety of the Wife of Bath's Tale. So make sure that you're getting that done. Uh, aside from that, you need to make sure that you are finishing your reading of Heart of Darkness, uh, Part 1, uh, pages 45 to 58. Okay, so it's not a very lengthy reading assignment, but uh, the Heart of Darkness is, uh, although it is a short uh, novel, it's a, it, technically a novella, which is uh, just a name for a short novel, uh, it's, it's a fairly complex read, okay? Uh, so uh, this is definitely the most challenging text uh, that requires... Uh, the most intelligence and uh, broadest range of vocabulary uh, in order to understand. So make sure that you're reading these pages carefully uh, and understanding what they mean just on a basic level uh, before we get into the process of actually analyzing it, okay? Uh, this needs to be, uh, you need to send email uh, reading check confirmation that you've completed this assignment by next Tuesday. All right, uh, aside from that, you just need to make sure that you are keeping up with our OTNs. Today we're going to be uh, conducting an extended SQ3R uh, for the first five pages of text, um, which, uh, like I said, uh, can be somewhat misleading uh, uh, upon first reading, and so I want to make sure that we're going through this together and I'm explaining uh, what Conrad is doing in this uh, these first five pages, okay? Uh, aside from that, you need to make sure that you are keeping tabs on your quarter four essay, which is going to be due in the middle of May. Uh, about a month from now. So uh, that essay obviously requires you to conduct a research project uh, defending a thesis uh, about Chaucer's perspective communicated in the Canterbury Tales uh, of a number of different subjects uh, of which you can choose one and then do a uh, little bit of background historical research to help contextualize your analysis. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and get into our OTN. All right, so uh, our first OTN is going to analyze the introductory scene, uh, pages 45 through 50, if you have the 2003 Barnes & Noble edition on hand, okay? So uh, very simply, in this introductory scene, Conrad introduces the narrators of the text, all right, of which there are two primary speakers. We'll talk about that just in, in a moment in our XQ3R, uh, and the environment in which the story is told, all right? Um, uh, the, the dominant setting of the story, okay? So uh, throughout OTN 1, we're going to be looking at the details of how that environment is uh, described and what um, the, those details suggest to us uh, on a symbolic level uh, as the entire narrative, very similar to, say, Dante's Inferno, uh, is, is deeply symbolic. Uh, the settings, um, the descriptions of the settings are meant to be read as symbols of uh, larger realities about the nature of the world in which uh, the characters live um, and the significance of the pilgrimage that the protagonist of the narrative, a man named Marlowe, uh, uh, the, the significance of his pilgrimage to the, quote, heart of darkness, okay, whatever that might be. All right, so uh, to improve our comprehension of the scene, we want to first, today, just work through an SQ3R, all right? Uh, when we get back uh, on Tuesday from our extended weekend, uh, we are going to be analyzing the text uh, of the, uh, uh, and, and describing um, uh, what the significance of the setting is, okay? Uh, noting some of the uh, details of the narrative there. And then also looking at Conrad's juxtaposition, all right, we'll talk more about what that word means, I'll remind you what that word means, of the two narrative voices, okay, uh, in the opening scenes, looking specifically at how Conrad characterizes the perspectives of both of these individuals, all right? So uh, let's go ahead and jump into our SQ3R. As always, okay, uh, we want to begin our analysis of the text with a basic comprehension of the text, okay? So um, as usual, we're gonna start by looking at the speaker 
of the text, of which there are two. Okay, so we're talking about speakers. There are two speakers uh, introduced in the first scene of the novella. All right, one is an unnamed individual. He is the first person who begins speaking. He doesn't have a name, uh, and he's going to listen to and record Marlowe, all right, so he's the second speaker and the protagonist of the story. He's the individual who actually goes on the journey uh, to uh, the Congolese interior, all right, uh, and he's going to listen and record that story, uh, which is spoken by Marlowe. Uh, on uh, something called the Nelly. It's a, a little sailboat that they're hanging out on. Um, and uh, Marlowe is our primary uh, protagonist, and he is the one who's going to spend uh, the, the most amount of time speaking throughout the course of the journey. Okay, so uh, very much like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, okay, uh, Conrad is establishing a kind of multi layered. Uh, framework narrative um, that uh, can be depicted, all right, the best way to understand this is, is this picture, okay? So the story begins uh, on the River Thames. The, the River Thames is a river that runs through London. It's a very famous river, okay? So it's spelled Thames or Thames, but it's pronounced Thames. Uh, so ask the English why, I don't know. Uh, but the story begins at dusk, okay? So as uh, the day is coming to an end, as the sun is setting, all right? And it ends at night, okay? And the story is told, the story within that frame is Marlowe's journey into the heart of darkness, okay? So this is uh, this story, Marlowe is going to begin speaking, all right, um, after the introductory scene, okay? Uh, he, we're not going to get into that, this actual story, which has a plot, uh, uh, in and of itself, and Marlowe is sort of, sort of the central character and also speaker of that story. But we're not going to get into that uh, until um, Conrad has laid out some some sort of groundwork that's going to foreshadow some of the themes that are explored in uh, in Marlowe's journey narrative, um, and introduce some of the sort of motifs uh, and, and symbolic significances of the setting, uh, and also sort of introduce us to our two speakers. Okay, so uh, the story. Uh, uh, within the story, Marlowe's journey happened in the recent past, okay? So when Marlowe is talking about his journey into the Congo where he's going to meet uh, 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 the sort of central figure uh, that he's going uh, to see, uh, this man named Kurtz, uh, he's referring to events that have happened in the past of his life, all right? And he is reporting those events uh, in the fictional present, all right, uh, as uh, sort of hours go by, as the sun sets and his story extends into uh, the middle of the night, okay? So the story moves from dusk, all right, in between light and dark uh, to absolute midnight or absolute darkness, okay? Uh, throughout that, the course of that story, two primary vo voices are, are heard, okay? We've got our unknown naive narrator, okay? Uh, that person is more closely associated with us as we have, uh, unlike Marlowe, not taken the journey into the heart of darkness yet. Okay, so we are the audience of the story, and therefore we are uh, sort of meant to find ourselves in a parallel relationship with uh, the unnamed naive narrator, uh, who we will investigate the characterization of uh, later. And uh, our second speaker is Marlowe, who has journeyed into the heart of darkness. He is no longer uh, naive. He has seen the world uh, as it truly is, according to Conrad's uh, worldview or perspective, which obviously the whole story is going to illustrate and unpack for us. Um, and uh, his story is going to reflect, all right, the effects of what that journey, ha uh, uh, what that journey means uh, to Marlowe's worldview, value system, and perspective of uh, other individuals and the world in which he lives, okay? So, uh, what's the genre uh, or style of this text? Well, uh, it's basically a journey narrative at its core, okay? Uh, it's a kind of dark pilgrimage, okay? It's, a, it's almost like an inversion of Dante's Inferno, okay? Which is a kind of symbolic or uh, allegorical pilgrimage journey in which a pilgrim, uh, very much like Marlowe, journeys into the heart uh, of his own darkness, into the depths of what it means uh, to have a dark heart, and then emerges from that uh, darkness into a sort of heavenly light, uh, into the light of the stars. 
Okay, so uh, in a very similar way, uh, the story is going to begin in a, uh, uh, in a position where like uh, the pilgrim, like the pilgrim in Inferno, he begins uh, naive. He begins uh, in the realm of unrepented sin. Uh, he begins in a space uh, uh, sort of uh, juxtapo uh, where there is juxtaposing uh, uh, light. Right there is the dark wood, uh, and there is the hilltop shawled in morning rays of light. And he is in between those two things, and he is longing to get to the light. Okay, uh, much in the same way, the story begins at dusk. Um, and finishes uh, after we have been exposed to what is at the heart, what is at the core of what Conrad and Marlowe call the heart of darkness. Okay, so it's a kind of dark pilgrimage. Uh, it's a colonial narrative. All right, so it's going to explore uh, 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 the Congo, a kind of distant uh, land uh, for uh, the European audience and uh, in the Western world. Uh, and it's styled by Conrad's use of what we call a framework story, okay? So, uh, and that framework story has multiple narrative perspectives and it's uh, sort of uh, lacking a clear chronology and there's interruptions, okay? All of these things are uh, 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 narrative moves that we would associate with the experimental uh, new storytelling techniques uh, of the modern era. So, in other words, Conrad's style blends together a very old form of uh, literary uh, storytelling called the pilgrimage or the journey, which is frankly the oldest kind of story uh, in the Western uh, literary canon, alongside or with or, or combined with uh, new and experimental uh, modernist forms of writing, okay, with this sort of multi-layered narrative perspectives with interruptions and the chronology, uh, digressions, and all other manner uh, of stylistic devices that Conrad uses in order to develop his themes uh, and communicate his narrative, okay? So uh, what is the title of this text? Well, uh, the, the text that we're studying, obviously, just pages 45 through 50, it doesn't have, uh, like, a title, all right? Conrad just calls it part one, okay? Uh, and part one overall is going to act as the exposition uh, of the journey narrative, all right? But the introductory scene, uh, we're not quite yet into the beginning of Marlowe's journey. We're going to get there next week. Uh, the, ex uh, the introductory scene is kind of the exposition of the exposition, all right? Introducing us to the setting in which the story itself is told, uh, and giving us a sort of introduction into these two primary speakers uh, that we're going to be analyzing closely. Okay, so uh, as we all know, an exposition of a narrative is just meant to introduce the major settings, the characters, and conflicts, all right, and like the narrative style uh, at work in the story as a whole. Okay, so what's our central question here that we're going to be driving uh, uh, toward an answer to? Basically, very simply, how does Conrad's style, uh, that's just, uh, that is to say, the details of his text, uh, his writing style, how does Conrad's style develop the significance of the narrative's setting? All right, uh, when I say significance, I do not just mean like uh, it's a literal uh, place or the literal time of day in which the story is being told, but rather it's symbolic significance, it's deeper significance uh, with re respect to the narrative's theme. Uh, or meaning, right? And also, right, uh, introduce the characters in the opening scene and the significance of their perspectives or their value systems, okay? So, uh, what I want to do for the next few minutes, uh, and this actually is probably going to take uh, a little bit of time here, um, I just want to go through and read, recite, and review on a literal level. Uh, what's going on in these opening pages, all right? So if you will, go ahead and turn uh, in your novel uh, to the beginning of the text, Heart of Darkness. Now, this is uh, pretty small, so uh, let's see. I'm going to stack my book on top of something else so you can see it a little bit better and then refocus uh, my camera on it, all right? Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of read through uh, paragraph through uh, by paragraph, uh, 45 through 50, and help explain what's uh, what just simply what's going on. Uh, then when we come back together uh, on Tuesday, uh, we'll analyze this text and uh, unpack its meaning. All right. So um, the story begins uh, with a description of 
where uh, Marlowe's story is going to be told. It's going to be told aboard uh, a cruising yawl, which is just to say a little sailboat called the Nelly. All right, uh, and the Nelly uh, swings to her anchor. In other words, she, she anchors herself or she is being anchored down uh, and comes uh, to a rest. The flooded maid, which is to say high tide, uh, has come and is beginning to slacken now. The wind was nearly calm. Okay, so it's kind of a slack tide. Uh, it's very calm. Uh, and it's bound down the river and out into the sea. Okay, uh, and so before it can do that, it just needs to wait uh, for the tide to go down so that it can begin uh, the process of following that tide out into the ocean. All right. So uh, where are they? Well, they're right at the sea reach, which is to say the mouth of the River Thames. The River Thames is a major river that runs through London. Okay, it's been a very uh, was a very important part and continues to be a very important part in English history and English culture, uh, a culture that was largely centered around um, uh, seafaring. Okay, uh, as an island nation. All right, uh, he describes uh, this as, uh, as an interminable, interminable waterway. Uh, in the offing, the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint. In other words, as the sun is going down, maybe you've had this experience uh, when you've been uh, at the beach or something like that, when you see the sun beginning to go down and the lines between uh, the sea and the sky begin to kind of blend together or weld together. And uh, it's simply, uh, he's just, uh, the narrator is just simply describing what that looks like to him as the sea is going, uh, sorry, the sun is going down and the sea and the sky are beginning to sort of weld together without a joint, which is to say without uh, any sort of creases or uh, any noticeable breaks between the two. Uh, they're in a place, uh, okay, a little port called Graves Inn, which is outside of London, uh, and that name obviously, uh, Graves Inn, uh, is uh, sort of evoking this kind of mood of somber contemplation of the inevitability of death. There's a mournful gloom brooding motionless over the biggest and greatest town on earth. The narrator, narrator there is just simply personifying uh, the atmosphere uh, uh, of uh, the, the day and the air uh, that is just hanging over uh, London, the biggest and greatest town on earth, and it seems to be brooding over it, hovering over it, motionless uh, and angry about something, uh, uh, the narrator seems to imply. Okay, The narrator then goes on to introduce um, some of the members who are aboard the Nelly. Okay? First of all, there's the director of companies. Uh, he kind of acts as the captain. Director of companies just means uh, a director of a merchant uh, company. All right, So he's a businessman, uh, buys and sells things, um, presumably goods that are imported and exported, uh, as he is a merchant and a seafaring man. All right, uh, And then there is a lawyer. Okay, uh, who's a good old boy, uh, who the narrator seems to like quite a lot. All right, uh, then he describes an accountant, and then he describes Marlow. Marlow is the only individual who gets a name, uh, which uh, is the way, the, the narrator's way of focusing our attention on the individuality of this character, Marlow, who sits cross-legged uh, near to the speaker. And he's got these sort of sunken cheeks, a yellow complexion, straight black, uh, straight back, an aesthetic aspect. All right, all of these uh, are just simply pointing out the fact that Marlowe just doesn't look like the rest of the guys around. He is different than them. Uh, and part of what the narrative is going to do is explore uh, the the internal differences that are sort of manifested in his physical strangeness. Okay. Um, uh, then, uh, the narrator then goes on to continue to describe uh, the, the, the day as it's coming to an end. The water shown pacifically, which just means largely. Uh, uh, in other words, the, the sea is just uh, vast. The sky without a speck was a benign immensity of unstained light. Okay, uh, So in other words, um, very much like when the sun is going down and the horizon is sort of uh, bathed in the glow uh, of uh, the setting sun. Uh, uh, it's the, the, the sky around them is sort of uh, bathed in this immensity of unstained light, uh, which is draping itself like a gauzy and radiant fabric. Okay, so here the figurative uh, language here of the simile is describing the light, all right, in the sky to uh, something like 
uh, a garment that is draping over in diaphanous folds. Diaphanous just means you can see through it uh, the, the shore. Okay, only the gloom to the west, the darkness that is coming, brooding over the upper reaches became more somber every minute as if angered by the approach of the sun. All right. Uh, and then finally, the sun uh, sort of dips uh, or continues to dip uh, beneath the horizon um, in this sort of imperceptible but steady fall nonetheless, all right, uh, leaving the group uh, in increasing darkness, all right? So uh, this leads to a change in the setting that the narrator describes. Uh, he says that it's less brilliant, it's less bright, but it's more profound. It's a sort of a deeper, uh, it's, a, it's a meditative atmosphere that is being um, cultivated here, all right? Uh, and uh, in light of these uh, sort of meditative atmosphere, the speaker begins to uh, wax nostalgic about uh, all of the uh, great men and great things that have come out of the River Thames through the course of English history. Okay, he refers to Sir Francis Drake, famous uh, explorer um, uh, 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 of English descent, uh, or Sir John Franklin, another famous explorer who uh, who was one of the first individuals to explore the the Arctic. Um, uh, knights, he refers to them all uh, as great knights of the sea. Okay, who had uh, who had uh, exited the Thames River uh, in, in, uh, with, with flashes of light, okay, uh, in, in, in ships called the Golden Hen. The Golden Hen was just Sir Francis Drake's famous ship, all right? He refers to them as generals uh, of the East India fleet, hunters for gold or pursuers of fame. They all had gone out on that stream bearing the sword and often the torch messengers of the might within the land, bearers of a spark from the sacred flame. All right, so here uh, the, the naive patriotic narrator uh, is simply expressing uh, his sort of uh, conventional European attitude that, uh, uh, as discussed in the opening lecture, that these European explorers and European colonists were taking with them this sort of sacred fire, this, uh, this illuminating um, fire, the flame of civilization and goodness with them as they floated out into the unknown dark world. Okay, uh, the sun sets, the dusk fell on the stream, the lights begin to peer, appear along the shore, and then interrupting the narrative voice or, or the naive narrator, Marlowe begins to speak and he says something strange. All right, Marlowe says, and this also, this referring to England, all right, this place that the speaker uh, views as or believes to be this sort of uh, bastion or of uh, the sacred fire of civilization, the center of human civilization. Uh, Marlowe says, this place. Also, London, the place where we are, the River Thames, as great as you think it might be, has also been one of the dark places of the earth. There's an interruption to Marlowe's thought as the narrator begins to describe uh, uh, Marlowe. And he, uh, in fact, says that Marlowe was not a normal kind of guy. Okay, He was more open-minded uh, more uh, aware, more philosophical, uh, more inquisitive, uh, more critically evaluative of the world around him than the typical sailor, okay? So again, our, our protagonist, Marlowe, is characterized here as a guy uh, who is a little bit different uh, than normal people, uh, a little more thoughtful than normal people. And the stories that he tell, uh, t tells, li like the one he's about to tell, uh, which is somewhat confusing, uh, is, is not a typical seaman's yarn, uh, uh, not a typical kind of story told by a sailor. Uh, rather, uh, it, 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 it is one um, that uh, its meaning is not inside like a kernel. So in other words, uh, uh, his stories are not like a nut to be cracked where you get this little sort of nugget of truth uh, or, or interesting little anecdote in the middle of it, but rather 
a, a, a story that sort of envelops the tale, which is brought out or seen clearly only by the glow. Only like a glow brings out the haze. So his stories are less clear. Okay, uh, they're not uh, quite as clearly. Uh, uh, they, they're not quite as clearly or simply meaningful as the typical story. Okay, this is just foreshadowing uh, some of the uh, and characterizing Marlowe as a narrator whose stories need to be thought of carefully and analyzed carefully in order to be understood correctly. All right, uh, then Marlowe begins to speak again. Right, and he says some weird stuff. All right, he he says, "I was thinking of the very old times." when the Romans first came here, okay? This is uh, a reference to when the Romans colonized uh, Britain um, 1900 years ago, okay? So uh, Marlowe is speaking uh, in the early 1900s or the late 1800s, so 1900 years ago would have been uh, right around uh, the turn from BC to AD when the Romans, uh, under the leadership of uh, Julius Caesar and then the subsequent uh, Caesars were conquering England uh, and Britain. And during that period of time, Britain, uh, very much like Congo, the Congo in the present day, was not considered to be quote unquote civilized, okay? Uh, light came out of this river since, you say, knights, okay? So Marlowe is uh, referring to uh, the speaker's description of. Uh, the great knights carrying the sacred fire out of uh, England on the page before. He says, uh, yeah, but it's like a running blaze on a plane, like a flash of lightning in the clouds. We live in the flicker, okay? So what he means by that is all of this light that you are uh, referring to uh, is, is, is just simply a flicker. It's something that was uh, not here uh, even just moments ago uh, and will not last uh, as time passes, okay? Um, but darkness was here yesterday, he says. Imagine the feelings of a commander on a fine, what do you call him, trireme. Trireme's just a Roman sailing vessel. In the Mediterranean, ordered suddenly to the north, run over land across the Gauls, that's just uh, ancient France, in a hurry, put in charge of one of these crafts. The legionaries, a wonderful lot of handy men they must have been to use to build, apparently by the hundreds in a month or two. If we may believe what we read, imagine him here, the very end of the world, a sea the color of lead, referring to the Atlantic's sort of deep leaden color, a sky the color of smoke, referring to uh, the typical haziness, uh, darkness, and coldness of, of the uh, British uh, atmosphere and, and weather, a kind of ship about as rigid as a concertina, and going up this river with its stores or orders or what you like, sandbanks, marshes, forest, savages, okay, so he refers to uh, uh, the, the, the sort of ancient Anglo-Saxon people as savages here, all right, somewhat ironically, precious little to eat, fit for civilized men, nothing but Tim's water to drink, no Falernian wine here, no going ashore, here and there a military camp lost in a wilderness like a needle in a bundle of hay, cold, fog, tempest, disease, exile, and death, death, skulking in the air, in the water, in the bush, they must have been dying like flies out here. He goes on to say uh, uh, that uh, essentially, uh, the individual, the Roman, who must have come, out, come up here in the uncivilized, uncolonized British landscape must have felt the savagery, the utter savagery, had closed around him. And that savagery uh, was, is, in Marlowe's perspective, uh, a very recent aspect of the British past. Okay? So here, he's obviously juxtaposed in his perspective to uh, the naive narrator, who seems to think of Britain uh, as a place where civilization has always been and always will be uh, prominent and prevalent. Okay, uh, This leads uh, this individual, this Roman individual, to surrender uh, to the powerlessness, the disgust, and the hate uh, that is at the heart of such savage landscapes. Okay. Finally, uh, Marlowe ends this section of the narrative, okay, and we'll end here for the day, by saying the conquest of the earth, which mostly means taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, 
is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. Okay, so in, in other words, uh, all those uh, knights errant of the sea who are taking English civilization out to the ends of the earth and colonizing and conquering all these savage people groups, it's not actually very pretty when you, when you look at it too much. It's mostly just theft. But, all right, if there's anything that redeems it, what redeems it is the idea only, the, the reason behind it, the idea. Okay, uh, if there is indeed a sacred fire, if there is some kind of, of uh, uh, ideal, moral ideal that is motivating these conquests, then that can redeem uh, all of the colonization, all of the scrambles uh, to, to uh, establish dominion over all of these quote-unquote savage peoples. All right, an idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, not just a feeling, but an idea an unselfish belief, one that is not necessarily uh, oriented towards selfish acquisition of material or satisfaction of your desires, but rather a true knightly chivalric ideal that is based on unselfish sharing of true, good, sacred uh, beliefs, all right? Something you can set up, something you can bow down before and offer yourself uh, in sacrifice of. Okay, so here, uh, basically, uh, in this opening scene, right, uh, there's a lot of tricky language here that we'll get into analyzing closely uh, in the future, but I just want to basically run through uh, what happened uh, uh, or what was spoken uh, in these first five pages. To, uh, uh, in our next lecture, we're going to be analyzing the significance of the setting and the characterizations of the narrative voices and how they juxtapose one another uh, on Tuesday. Hope you guys have a great Easter weekend uh, and make sure that you continue uh, to work through your reading of Heart of Darkness. Make sure you're reading this very intentionally. Uh, paying attention to the details, looking up words that you don't know, uh, uh, tracking down allusions uh, or references that you aren't sure about, like look up the word trireme, okay, or look up what the Thames is, okay, look up what a cruising y'all is. All of these things are uh, vital for your success in this unit uh, because this text is somewhat difficult to read. All right, it's the most difficult text we've read together, so it's going to require some work, some reading work on your behalf to understand. Hope you guys have a great day.